Good morning to everybody. So we are starting our uh, Thursday morning uh, session. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce Eli Zeldov, the first talk of today. It will be online talk. And the topic of the talk is imaging the local band topology and Chernozai in magic angle Griffin. Eli, it's your time. Thank you. Eli, can you hear me? Eli, we cannot hear you. Yes, sorry, I was muted. Uh -huh. um, okay, so please um, start. Yes, okay. so thank you, Natalia, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our recent work. <clears throat> I'll be talking about uh, imaging topology and the churn mosaic in magic angle graphene. The picture that you see here is an image of orbital magnetization in magic angle graphene. That will be the, the main topic of our discussion today. Uh, this work uh, was done in um, close collaboration with Barcelona, a group of uh, Dima Ifetov, uh, Peter and Giorgio, uh, and our team at Weizmann, Mati, Samir, Aviram, and Ranil, Yuri and Alex, and our theory friends, Joanne, Keshav, Binghai, Adi, and Erez. Uh, and the HBN crystals come from NIMS. Uh, so let me start from uh, the big picture, and in particular, topology. So uh, topology is, is a concept that emerged in, in the recent years as a central theme in, in condensed matter physics. Um, and in particular, if your bands are topological, then they're described by a churn number. Uh, and we think of it as, as a global topological property. Um, but still, topology remains quite an abstract concept. And I want to pose the following question. Can we image in some way or visualize topology on a local scale? It doesn't sound uh, uh, valid or, or meaningful question because, uh, as I said, we think of topology as, as a global property and of churn number as, as a global topological invariant. And therefore, the question of local topology sounds not very meaningful. So let's ask ourselves, what is the source of topology? And this is Barry curvature. So if we integrate Barry curvature over the Fermi surface of a full band, it must be an integer uh, equals C, and this is our churn number. So for example, in graphene, the source of, of uh, Barry curvature is the Dirac crossing of the bands. And if we open a gap uh, due to interactions or breaking of symmetry, uh, the, the singular Barry curvature at the Dirac point spreads into the bands. And for example, at the bottom of the K valley, the integral of the Berry curvature or Berry flux equals to pi. And in the K prime value, it will be minus pi. In contrast to churn number, which is defined only for a full band, the Berry curvature is defined for any chemical potential. And therefore, we can ask ourselves a, a more general, even more fundamental question whether the Berry curvature can be visualized in some way. But again, this, this uh, question is not clear because Berry curvature is defined in the case space. And it's not clear what's the meaning of the Berry curvature in the real space. But you have to remember that Berry curvature in the case space acts uh, as a magnetic field inducing orbital magnetization very similar to a regular magnetic field. So now, but orbital magnetization is a measurable quantity and it is well defined locally. So actually orbital magnetization is the answer to, to our questions because if we can image orbital magnetization, we can address all these questions of local topology and local very curvature. The problem is that orbital magnetization is quite weak and so far it has evaded 
direct experimental visualization and image. Uh, another important point is that um, uh, the, uh, the orbital magnetization due to Bera curvature has a close analogy to orbital magnetization induced in the quantum hole state by real fields in this case, whereas here it is by, by magnetic field in the momentum space. So if you think of a quantum hole state, then in the bulk uh, of the sample, you think of closed uh, electron cyclotron orbits, uh, which contribute a diamagnetic moment. So this is in the bulk. And along the edges in the incompressible states, the electrons follow the what we call skipping orbits, uh, which contribute a paramagnetic moment. And these currents are a result of of in-plane electric field due to confining potential that gives rise to the chiral edge channels that uh, that flow in the opposite direction to the currents in, in the bulk. Uh, similarly, uh, the Berry curvature induces two components of orbital magnetization. One is the self-rotation of the wave function, which we call M self-rotation, MSR. Uh, which is analogous to this uh, cyclotron orbits in some sense. And the other is the anomalous velocity uh, of the wave function or wave packet, again, induced by, by transverse electric field, which causes the drift of the center of the, of the mass of the wave function, which we call uh, churn magnetization because it is dominant uh, in the incompressible states, in the, in the churn gaps in contrast to the self-rotation, which is dominant in the metallic state. So by this analogy to the quantum hall, uh, we generally expect the MSR and MC to be of opposite sign. Uh, so now we want to, to actually to try to image the orbital magnetization and to, to understand uh, some insights on the topology. Uh, our tool is squid on tip. We take a quartz tube of about one millimeter, pull it to a sharp pipette down to a few tens of nanometers. Mm -hmm. And then we use one of these superconductors uh, to do three-step deposition. In the first step, we coat one side of the pipette, then the other. And then the third step, we coat uh, the ring at the apex. Uh, so as a result, <coughs> where the leads overlap the ring, we have stronger superconductivity. And in the gap between the leads, we have a weaker superconductivity, which form the weak links uh, of a squid. So now this is how it looks uh, in uh, scanning electron microscope. This is an indium uh, squid. So you see one lead, another lead, the gap between the two, and you see the hole uh, at the apex. So now we have an extremely sensitive a device residing at the apex of a sharp needle, uh, which is ideally suited for scanning probe microscopy. These devices, the squids can be as small as 40 nanometers. They operate in fields of over a Tesla. Actually, the, for molyurinium, we can go up to five Tesla. They have very no, low flux noise, a very good field sensitivity, and in particular, uh, they have extremely good uh, spin sensitivity. Namely, if you ask yourself how many spins I can detect if I put them at the apex of the tip, uh, and the answer is 0.3 Bohr magneton per square root hertz. Namely, we have enough sensitivity to image the magnetic field of a single electron spin. It turns out that these devices are also extremely sensitive thermometers. And we can study dissipation in quantum systems with a micro Kelvin uh, imaging capability. But uh, today I will not discuss uh, any of the thermal imaging. I will focus only on magnetic imaging. In order not to crash into the sample, we attach this uh, squid on tip to a quartz tuning fork, which has a sharp resonance at uh, about 30 kilohertz. And we use the, we monitor the change in this resonant frequency as we approach the surface, uh, which is essentially force sensing, uh, which allows us, like, like you do in atomic force microscopy, which allows us to scan at a height of few tens of nanometers uh, above the surface. 
Uh, so, so today I'll be describing uh, uh, orbital magnetization in magic angle graphene. These samples come uh, from Barcelona. Uh, so this is a sample in the form of a whole bar. Uh, and uh, again, it is a magic angle encapsulated in HPN. Uh, the angle is about 1.8 degree. Uh, and these are the transport measurements at 300 millikelvin showing the RxX and RxY. And actually they display all the beauty uh, uh, the, and the fascinating things that you have in magic angle graphene, um, like uh, correlated insulating states at integer fillings, uh, Landau fans, uh, churn insulators, uh, these lines here, superconductivity, the suppressed uh, resistance goes to zero in this region. Um, and in addition, this particular sample also showed magnetism uh, in this region uh, of filling factor one, namely one electron per Moiré unit cell. Uh, the orbital magnetism has been observed in several types of devices, uh, both in magic angle graphene and in trilayer graphene. Uh, by a number of groups. Usually the orbital magnetization transport is visible near filling factor three. Uh, in this case, we see it pronouncedly in near filling factor one. So in transport measurements, if you, if you measure uh, Rxy as a function of field in this window, this is what you see. Uh, the Rxy shows a pronounced hysteresis around zero magnetic field. Um, at close to filling factor one, which is a clear signature of, uh, of orbital ferromagnetism. You can also scan, uh, sweep the filling factor at a fixed magnetic field. And also here you see a clear hysteresis as a function of filling factor now at a given low magnetic field. Uh, it is less intuitive to understand that it arises from orbital magnetization, but in fact, it is, uh, it is equivalent to, to field uh, sweeping. And we will be mainly focusing on sweeping the filling factor rather than magnetic field. Uh, so these were global transport measurements, conventional ones. Uh, so now we want to focus on our local imaging. So this is the schematic setup. And this is our squid on tip. This is the sample, the magic angle graphene with top and bottom HBN with a graphite baggate. Uh, and we ground the sample. So uh, all what I will be showing today is there is no transport current flowing in the sample. We just apply a DC voltage to the baggate, with which we can control the carrier density in the sample. And we will be focusing in the vicinity of filling factor one. And in addition, we apply a small AC baggate voltage, which modulates the carrier concentration of the filling factor by 0.08 uh, in, in, in the particular data set that I will be showing you. And what we measure is the local AC component of the magnetic field. Namely, what we measure is by how much the local magnetic field changes as we add and remove 0.08 electrons per Moiré unit cell. This is our signal. We are at 300 millikelvin. Applied field is very small, 50 millitesla. And this is what we measure. Uh, so this is the position uh, along the sample in microns. Uh, and this is the AC magnetic field that we measure locally in units of nano Tesla. So these are very weak signals. And we're uh, in this particular case near filling factor one. We can take this local magnetic field and do magnetization reconstruction, essentially inversion of the Biot-Savart law and translate it into local magnetization. So this is the local differential magnetization in units of Bohr magneton per electron. Namely, if we add one electron to the system by how much the local magnetization increases, you can think of it as if you add one electron per, let's say, Moiré unit cell, this will be the change in the magnetization per unit cell. And, uh, and so you see both positive 
red and negative blue magnetization uh, with a scale of about 20 Bohr magneton per electron. So this is very large magnetization, much larger than the spin magnetization that arises from spin. And essentially, we'll be ignoring spin, uh, focusing uh, only on this orbital magnetization. Uh, so this uh, this image was acquired at this filling factor uh, after initiating the system at large at sorry at low filling factor let's say zero and then sweeping the filling factor up to this value and taking the image we can do the opposite we can initiate the system at large filling factor and then go down to the same one and again take an image upon sweeping the filling factor down. Uh, and then we can just take numerical difference between the two. So just one minus the other divided by two. And this is this shows the difference here. So the first thing you see that the enlarged part of the sample the magnetization is completely reversible, regardless of the history. And in other parts of the sample, the magnetization is hysteretic. And if you look carefully, this pattern looks identical to this pattern which means that this entire region <coughs> has flipped its magnetization as a whole between this and these images. So this is at filling factor of close to one, but we can do it at various filling factors. Uh, and here is the movie of the orbital magnetization as a function of filling factor from 0.7 to 1.17. Uh, we start from low filling factor. You see mainly uh, red patches. So these are red means paramagnetic, namely this is favorable energetically, whereas blue is diamagnetic, namely M dot B term uh, is unfavorable. So we start from a few patches which are favorable uh, magnetically, and we increase the filling factor. You see that the magnetization grows but also there are quite a lot of blue patches appearing and overall the magnetization grows and so does the hysteresis. And now we're at filling factor one where we reach maximum magnetization. And if we continue to increasing the filling factor, uh, both the reversible and irreversible magnetization uh, decrease. So we can take this data and, and make a three-dimensional rendering of it. So these are the two spatial coordinates, and this is the filling factor through one. So this is upon sweeping the filling factor up. This is upon sweeping down, and this is the difference. Uh, and we're looking at the different cuts of this three-dimensional presentation. You see that the orbital magnetization is highly non-trivial, having both paramagnetic and diamagnetic regions and sharp transitions between them uh, and quite complicated dynamics. Uh, so, so in order to make some deeper understanding of the orbital magnetization, uh, we first do some band structure calculations. So we assume uh, complete degeneracy lifting. So we are talking about four, uh, four bands, uh, two K bands and two K prime bands. Uh, and we ignore spin. Uh, and this is the band structure calculation of, uh, of valley K, for example, of this conduction valley. valley. Um, I'm sure you are familiar with the general structure of the, of the band structure in magic angle graphene. Uh, and it has a sharp uh, maximum. The bands have, uh, the dispersion has a sharp maximum near gamma point uh, in energy of a few milli electron volts. We can calculate the Barry curvature uh, in this uh, single particle picture, and we see that essentially most of the Barry curvature is, is concentrated at the top of the band uh, near the gamma point. And we can also calculate the orbital magnetization arising from this Barry curvature, and not surprisingly, it is also concentrated where the Barry curvature is concentrated near. Uh, near the gamma point, and the numbers are comparable to the experiment of the order of 30 Bohr magneton per electron near this gamma point. So now we can plot the calculated uh, this differential magnetization, which is what is, is essentially the self-rotation part 
of the orbital magnetization as a function of filling factor. So at, uh, at low fillings, we, we are here at the bottom of the band. Uh, so the self-rotation magnetization is very small. And when we approach the top of the band, it shoots up. Uh, and the self-rotation magnetization is zero in the gap. Uh, and then if we go to K prime value, we get the same thing just with negative sign. Uh, the second part of the orbital magnetization is the churn magnetization, which is essentially zero in the, in the bands. And it has a maximum and negative sign uh, in the gap. And in fact, in the gap, the churn magnetization, uh, derivative of the magnetization with respect to the chemical potential is just given by the churn number. So the total uh, magnetization should, uh, should increase gradually, uh, has a maximum at the top of the band, and then dive into negative region in the gap, uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so this is what we expect uh, from band structure calculation. Uh, and if we look at our data, this is orbital magnetization, the same that is calculated, the total orbital magnetization that is calculated here as a function of position and filling factor. And we see that it looks very different from this uh, simple picture. But in fact, uh, after you stare enough on it and analyze it, you can make a lot of sense. So let's start from this patch. So we start from relatively low filling factor. So we're somewhere here. And we expect to have a sharp red followed by sharp blue or orbital magnetization. And this is, in fact, what we see, a sharp red followed by a sharp blue, which means that <clears throat> we have now shifted our, our Fermi level uh, into the gap. So we understand where we are here. Uh, so now we want to understand what's what's going on as we continue to increasing the filling factor. Uh, for this, we, rather than looking at this differential magnetization, we should look at the total magnetization, the integral of this. So the integral of the self-rotation magnetization increases uh, gradually as we move towards the top of the band. It has this overshoot here and remains constant. Uh, in the gap because there are no density of states there. Uh, whereas the, the churn magnetization is zero uh, in, the, in the metallic state and, uh, and it decreases or increases in magnitude linearly in the gap as a function of chemical potential uh, and becomes uh, largely negative. Uh, so now, so the total magnetization should increase, become positive, and then in the gap region, it should decrease. And if the gap is large enough, it will, the total magnetization will become negative, which means that it will become highly unfavorable uh, energetically. This is the point where the magnetization should flip sign. Uh, and this is this point here. So now the system has two options. Either we can continue to fill the next band, the K prime band, which means that we will become negative and unfavorable energetically, or we can recondense all the electrons from the K valley to the K prime valley, flip all this, recondense all the electrons between all the valleys, and therefore flip all these curves flip their sign through a first order transition. Eli, there is a question from Andrei Yes, Chibokov. sure. Eli, can you elaborate on your electronic structure? Is there other evidence that the band you label as K reach a maximum at gamma at approximate one, at near approximate one? Uh, you are talking about this band structure calculation. So this is just a straightforward single particle band structure calculation, if this is the question. Yes, if I can, this was the question, if you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can hear yes. you very well. Very good, sorry. Uh, I'm just staying in my room just out of precaution. Um, so you have bands at K and K prime. These are, they have direct points at charge neutrality. Then you start feeding in these bands. And uh, the question and is: We, we uh, assume full full degeneracy lifting. 
due to interactions, we, we, the, the, the generous lifting is by hand. The okay, fact that you see orbital magnetization, it means that the time reversal symmetry is broken. If all right. the bands are degenerate, mm -hmm. orbital magnetization is zero by, by definition, essentially, Absolutely. because the uh, orbital magnetization of K and K prime values uh, cancel each other. Absolutely. But if you start with the band, uh, with the direct point at K, and start feeling in the band, yes. uh, many things happen before the band reaches maximum at gamma point. You probably Due go to interaction. Micro point, etc. Yes, uh, I'm asking simple, maybe just to not to interrupt your talk. A uh, question is: uh, Is there any other experimental evidence that around n equal to one? I'm talking about n equal to one. Uh, yes. The band, one of the band, reaches maximum at gamma. Okay, there is there is a gap at nu equals one. Okay, this mm -hmm. is. We see it locally. So the mm -hmm. fact that you see negative orbital magnetization actually means that here you are in the gap. Okay, so this was the previous picture. And the fact that you have, so people also observe quantum anomalous Hall state quantized, which also tells you that you must be in the gap for quantization. Absolutely. So the fact, yes. Yeah, the question was about gamma about point gamma, how you know that it's uh, physics related to closeness to gamma point, just from experimental perspective. Experimental perspective, uh, again, we know that uh, that we are in a gap at filling factor one. Mm -hmm. So you can think of complicated scenarios where you will be at filling factor one, will open some gap due to some interaction without having one full band and empty three bands. Uh, but you know, we we start from the simplest scenario and try to make sense. Okay, whether it fine. works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is the conventional, simple picture of the generous lifting due to interaction, where at filling factor one, uh, you have one full band, completely spin and valley polarized, and three empty bands. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Continue. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so now we're exactly at this point, and this black line, you see that all the magnetization changes discontinuously in contrast to here where the magnetization changed sign, but in a continuous way. Here along this line, black line, the magnetization has flipped its sign discontinuously. So this is the first order of transition, uh, which we interpret as recondensation of carriers from k value, let's say, to, to k prime. Uh, uh, and then we continue, and then the magnetization becomes positive again, and we continue now filling the, the k, which is now empty, the k value, whereas the k prime uh, is full. Uh, so we, we understand this slice. But now what about this slice, so this patch? It seems to have a completely opposite uh, behavior. Uh, so for this, we have to, to change slightly the way we think about the bands. And rather than classifying them in, in terms of valleys, and for each valley you have a conduction and valence band, we want to think in terms of churn bases, where the valleys are classified by the churn number. And the churn number is dictated by the product of the valley and sublattice polarization AB. So instead of uh, drawing schematically our bands like this, we should draw them like this, where all four bands are equivalent and given by the product of valley and sublattice polarization. Uh, and if our and the sublattice polarization is dictated by staggered substrate potential due to HBN. So if our Sublattice uh, substrate potential is negative, namely we open a negative gap if you want. Then the A sublattice has a lower energy, and B sublattice has a high energy. So this will be our bands. So in this case, this full band at filling factor one will have a churn number of plus one. And if our substrate potential is positive, all this flip B sublattice now is favorable. So it has a lower energy and A sublattice has a higher energy. And this full band now has a churn number of minus one. This, the key point here is that 
by looking at the churn magnetization or the magnetization in the gap, the churn magnetization is directly given by the churn number. So all we need is just to read out the colors. Red color tells us that we have a churn number plus one here, and blue color tells us that the churn number is minus one. This is completely general, independent of the band structure, independent of the model. This is just a result of Strata formula. You can just think of it that your local sigma x y here is, is negative or positive, doesn't matter. So this is just imaging the local sigma x y, which is dictated by the churn number. And if the signs are opposite, it means that your local churn number is opposite. So now we have a unique tool to determine the local topology uh, directly with no essential model independent, if you want. So, so uh, and now we can color our regions by, we color them by, by the self-rotation magnetization here, uh, which has an opposite sign to the churn magnetization in the gap. And now that we can do this analysis in 2D, and this is what we find. So we, we find that the local churn number is position dependent. So you form some churn mosaic with positive and negative churn numbers on a scale of about a micron. And there are regions that show no orbital magnetization, meaning that either the local churn number is zero or you don't have a gap. So you have a semi-metal with overlapping bands. This, this is quite different from what we usually think. So, so what we find is that topology, rather than being a global property or churn number, rather than being a topological invariant, it becomes a local property. So, so this is, changes our, our way we think of churn insulate and in general and topology in particular. And this has been realized by, by several recent papers, uh, theory papers, uh, and it has, it has quite far reaching implications. One of them is that, or one of the main ones is that now you will have topological edge states between the different churn numbers. Uh, namely, you have states in the in the gap, and you will have uh, edge currents, uh, which are quite quite significant. In particular, if you are in the gap, the currents that flow on the edges are topological currents, and we can image them directly. So essentially, you can either describe your magnetic field due to magnetization or due to currents, and we can just invert the the local magnetic field into local currents. And these are the currents that actually flow in the system. So now I'll show you a movie. The units here are microamps per micron. These are very large currents, uh, larger than the typical currents that you apply in transport measurements. So this is how the currents involve as a function of filling factor. Uh, this is the 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 absolute value. This is the magnitude of the current. So some of these current loops flow clockwise. Some of them form flow counterclockwise. We know exactly just I don't know how to plot it. So what is shown here is the, the magnitude, the absolute value of the current. It reaches maximum near filling factor one. And as we increase the filling factor, it decays. I'll show you in a second. But what is important to realize that these are topological currents that couple to transport current. So when you apply transport current to this state, you have to think how the currents flow, which are very different from what we naively think. And again, this is because you have gapped regions and you have edge states, um, which are combined. So as we increase the filling factor, the these currents decay, but they remain essentially at, at any filling factor, quite far from filling factor one. Uh, so now we understand these red patches as uh, that having a churn number of minus one, and we denote them as Ka, and we want to understand what are these blue patches. So we know that they must have a churn number of plus one, but there, there are two possibilities for that. Either we flip 
the sublattice, polar, uh, sub-lattice polarization, or we flip the value k to k prime. So let's start from, from this option, k prime a. So this option has two penalties. So this blue patch has one penalty of having unfavorable m dot b. And the second is k, k prime domain wall. So we have two prices to pay and there is no energy gain because we don't know of any mechanism that favors value k over k prime or vice versa. So we can rule out this option. The kb uh, option again has two penalties. It has a penalty of unfavorable magnetization and in this case a b domain well. But this option does has an energy gain, which is delta. Uh, so, so this so we conclude that these patches are essentially stabilized by the sublattice uh, potential, and these are uh, they have domain walls between A and B sublattices. So the edge states or the the band structure across these two patches should look something like this. So the neighboring patches, rather than flipping their valley, as we would naively think in the conduction band, right? If we think in the and uh, not in the churn basis. Um, instead of flipping their valleys, actually they flip conduction and valence bands. So a Ka band, which is conduction band in the uh, on this in this red patch, becomes a valence band uh, in the opposite uh, patch, uh, and uh, and the opposite for the Kb. Uh, so again, this has strong implications, uh, which means that we will have now topological edge states, uh, non-trivial edge states uh, at these interfaces. Uh, yes, and there will be chiral, of course. Uh, so, uh, so now, let, uh, finally, let me discuss this first order transition. Uh, so, uh, so in order to understand this transition, we have to consider two energy contributions. One is the just m dot b term. So m is the orbital magnetization local, and b is the applied field. Uh, and this magnetic energy scales as as the domain side or patch size uh, square, the, just proportional to the area uh, of this domain. Uh, the other is the domain wall energy, which scales with uh, with the size of the uh, linearly with the size of the domain and recently uh, the, uh, the domain well energy has been calculated to be on the order of 0 0.05 milli electron volts per nanometer so we can just plug in all the numbers that we know from experiment and what we find is that the minimal domain size uh, should be of about five microns namely if if we have domains that are smaller than about five microns, <clears throat> um, the, the, the domain wall energy is the dominant one. Whereas uh, if the domains are large, then you gain, you can gain from this, uh, uh, from the bulk orbital magnetization. So essentially this blue patch, the system prefers to have unfavorable M dot B term in order to avoid the large domain wall energy. Uh, and therefore, this gives rise to the fact that when this domain flips, it is unfavorable, it is more favorable to flip, when this patch flips, it is more favorable to flip a large domain on the order of five microns uh, in order to avoid additional KK prime domain walls. So this is an analysis of this. Okay, there is a question. Yes, please. Uh, so from Sonia Haddad, uh, what govern the space distribution of the Chern mosaic? Are there edge states at the system boundaries or local edge currents cancel each other? Uh, okay, so so this, this goes to the previous uh, slide that I've shown the currents. So think of this red patch and blue patch. So around red patch, you will have, let's say clockwise currents. And around blue, you have anti-clockwise current, but where the red meets blue, they add up, they don't cancel out. So, so actually the, the edge states or the edge chiral currents, they add up, they don't cancel out each other. Um, so I don't know if this answers the question. 
I think so. Okay, this is in in contrast to to you know uh, when you think of of orbits, let's say closed orbits of electrons in quantum hole, they all have the same chirality. So they cancel each other and you, you have edge states only along the edges. But here, because the chair numbers are opposite, actually they add up. Of course, you will have also along the edge. If your patch reaches the edge, you will have a current on the edge, but they do not cancel out in the bulk. On the contrary, they add up on the edges. Uh, okay, so we are back to, to this question. So this is the statistics of where this first order transition occurs for each pixel in our sample. So, so the chair numbers are dense on the order of microns, but now we're, when we analyze at which filling factor uh, each pixel flips its orbital magnetization, we see a very different pattern. So for example, this large domain flips as a whole at the filling factor of one. This domain flips as a whole at the filling factor of one or, I don't know, two. Uh, and this uh, large domain flips at the filling factor of 1.1. So, so uh, when it flips, all the, the patches, both blue and red, flip their orientation in order to avoid causing additional domain walls. So this is what, what you see here. Uh, and as you can see, this, this typical scale of this large domain flipping is on the order of five microns consistent with this very naive calculation. So with this, I think uh, I should summarize. Um, so, so there are several points to, to take home. One is that we, there is, we have a first tool of imaging orbital magnetization and uh, orbital magnetization is just a, a representation of your local topology on your local barrel curvature. So now we, we can open this whole range of understanding the local topology in a wide variety of topological materials. The other is that specifically in magic angle graphene, we find that rather than uh, having a global topological invariant, a churn number in a gap state, actually the sample is broken into churn mosaic on the scale of about a micron. And this is a new type of disorder. It is a topological disorder driven by sublattice polarization and substrate potential due to HBN. And it is essentially unavoidable. Okay, and because you have a more is coming from, from HBN and more is coming from the bilayer graphene, and you will always have regions which are mostly aligned to, to K. This, uh, the, uh, or the, the HBN is mostly favors uh, A sublattice and regions where it mostly favors B sublattice. So it's, it's a new type of disorder that we should be aware of and, and think seriously about it. Uh, the, the last point is that we observe a first order uh, transition in which the electrons recondense from valley K to K prime, giving rise to hysteresis and formation of uh, domain walls. So let me leave you with this uh, movie of orbital magnetization and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for very interesting talk questions. Just thanks for the talk. The very curvature is very sensitive also to hetero strains. Uh, can you quantify if you have them there or not? Um, okay, so our our length scale, our characteristic scale that we can measure are tens of nanometers, and we don't know the local atomic structure. So we can do guesses, we can think why the churn number uh, differs from point to point. This is what I've presented, is just a, a simple interpretation in terms of HBN alignment without strain. And in fact, this particular sample, by all our, both by fabrication and by transport measurement is not aligned. So it even complicates the matters even further. Um, 
and I'm sure strain is an important factor. Twist angle, angle disorder is an important factor. But eventually, the system, if, if you are gapped, and we know that the bands are topological, the system has to decide whether locally it has a churn number plus one or minus one. And it is not at all trivial that it should choose the churn number of, let's say, plus one through the entire sample. On the contrary, there are very good reasons why it shouldn't do so. And I think this is the main message here. Uh, so why is the orbital magnetization is not periodic, you know, because the Moire, in Moire you have a periodic lattice. Uh, yes. So again, our scale at which we image is much of the Moire unit cell is about uh, 12 nanometers, so 13 nanometers. Uh, and our scale, so we average over, over a much larger scale. But even if we would have, okay, so maybe I should I should show this. So, so again, in this picture that I've presented, that the local germ number is determined whether your A sublattice, carbon sublattice, is closer to boron or nitrogen. Okay, and obviously, when you think of these, uh, both uh, HBN and the Moire unit cell uh, lattice, there will be regions where you are mostly closer to the B sublattice, uh, to the boron, uh, or to the nitrogen. And actually, recently, McDonald has done this calculation, uh, taking a aligned HPN with commensurate angle. Uh, and um, so in this case, you have super moire, you have a superstructure on a much larger scale. Uh, and this is what you get. So these are, again, perfectly uh, periodic crystals. And these are the chair numbers that you expect locally on a scale of about a micron, okay? But they are, you're absolutely right. They, are, they should be completely periodic. If, uh, but if you take into account strain and uh, twist angle variations, the, this picture will become highly non-periodic. And this is what we think we see. Do, do you also get orbital magnetization away from magic angle? We haven't, so, so generally we see strong orbital magnetization in any system that we have looked at so far, um, but specifically we haven't looked at magic angle, at a twisted bilayer graphene away from magic angle. Uh, we have one more question from online. So, the question is from Rakesh Dora. Is your sample uh, a different phase of the matter not in churn insulator? Because here the churn number is distributed specially. Can, can you repeat the question you're asking? What is the churn number? So the that... question is, uh, so if uh, what you're finding is a different uh, phase of matter than churn insulator. And the reasoning is uh, just because churn number you're... is distributed specially. Uh, okay, so this is just uh, this is a matter of semantics. How do you call this this thing? So we we call it churn mosaic. Um, so locally within each patch, you are you are churn insulator, but the different patches are insulating states with different churn number, and of course the the interface, the boundary between them, you will close the gap, uh, right, and you will have edge states. Uh, what is interesting, if you look at transport, okay, so this is the churn gap. This is what, what we sort of usually define as a churn gap. And in transport, you see it very clearly at high magnetic fields, and it has a churn number of minus three, okay, instead of plus one. So, so at, uh, this is something that one has to understand how you go from one to another. We concentrate it on very low fields where, where you don't, uh, where you have globally a churn mosaic. So eventually when you increase the magnetic field, the magnetic field will force all the domains to have the same uh, churn number, uh, okay? So, um, uh, but still you will have domains. So instead of having uh, domains between plus and minus uh, churn number due to, so instead of having domains between K A uh, and K prime uh, and K B, let's say, 
you will have domains between Ka and K prime B, both having the same chair number dictated by your large magnetic field, because it will force the same chair number in order to have favorable orbital magnetization. But you will still have A, B domain wells, and one has to think how, how all this evolves at high magnetic fields. Uh, so this is uh, work for future. Thank you very much. We have to go on. Let's thank Ellie once again. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so uh, next up is...